Excellent. Let's get started. Welcome, everybody, for coming tonight. I'm Stuart Gottlieb. I will be the host and moderator for the evening. I teach here at SEPA, <clears throat> where I'm also a member of the Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies, which is hosting uh, this event. Um, prior to working at SEPA, I've worked in the worlds of politics and communications, so I have a lot of interest in the topic for the evening. <clears throat> and uh, just want to thank everyone for coming for what promises to be a very spirited evening of discussion and debate on a topic that remains front and center in American politics, and that's the relationship between Donald Trump and the American news media. While Trump is broadly viewed as a quote-unquote disruptor of business as usual in American politics, favorably by his supporters, I might add, scathingly by his detractors, there's no issue that's been deemed more important than Trump's disruptive relationship with the press. And that's because the critical role the press and free speech in general play in maintaining and preserving this democracy. <clears throat> As George Washington put it in 1783, quote, the freedom of speech may be taken away and dumb and silent, we may be led like sheep to the slaughter, unquote. Thomas Jefferson went even more extreme in 1787. Just as America's new constitutional government was being drafted, quote, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. The importance of a free press and free speech simply cannot be overstated. So let me kick off the evening tonight with a quote from the president who has brought us all together. <laughs> Because who can forget this disruptive and disturbing line questioning the very premise of free, speech, of, uh, of free press? Quote, nothing can now be believed which is seen in a newspaper. Truth itself becomes suspicious by being put into that polluted vehicle, unquote. In other words, beware of fake news. But that was not Donald Trump. That was also Thomas Jefferson, this time writing toward the end of his second term as president in 1807, and after having been for years the subject of all sorts of malicious attacks in the press, along with the uncovering of several uncomfortable truths about his private life. And I refer to him as the president who has brought us together tonight because he was the inspiration for the Bill of Rights and its all important free speech protections in the First Amendment being added to the US Constitution in the First Congress. And I should note that by the end of his public life, Jefferson had completely given up on the partisan venom and the often unsubstantiated accusations being leveled in the press. Writing in 1812, quote, I have given up newspapers altogether and I find myself much the happier, <clears throat> which is advice I give my students about social media now and that's, and that's why. Um, I should also mention that George Washington had also given up on newspapers by the end of his life after being relentlessly accused of such absurdities as inflating his revolutionary war record and of being a secret agent of a foreign power. No, not Russia the British monarchy. Now, I'm bringing all this up tonight in order to place our topic in its proper historical context. The fact is this country has always had, since its founding, a somewhat uncertain and sometimes very controversial relationship with the free speech, with free speech and the free press. We know that there have been dark periods, such as the Sedition Act in 1798, which made it a crime to, quote, write, print, utter, or publish any false, scandalous, and malicious writings against the government. Same goes for the Espionage and Sedition Acts in 1917 and 1918, which essentially did the same. And we know that there have been periods in which new communications technologies, something that can do so much good for society, contributed to deeply uncertain periods in American history, such as the role the New Telegraph played in the 1850s in inciting both sides towards a civil war. And then there's the rise of mass radio communications in the 1930s, co-opted by the racist isolationist Father Charles Coughlin in his weekly addresses that reached more than 30 million listeners, helping contribute, I would argue, to America's late entry into World War II. And we know there have been periods like the Red Scare McCarthy era of the 1950s, when free expression was under assault, not just by government, but in the private sphere as well. So the question we're addressing tonight is, what is the threat of our time? And equally important, what will the history books write about this time? Will it be looked back upon like the other times I just mentioned, in which the country managed to get through, sometimes with great difficulty, and come out the other side better than before? Or are there unique perils to this moment that require our strict attention? 
I say that especially because this time feels in some ways almost like a combination of the others, with heightened passions on all sides, cutting edge new technologies like social media platforms playing a great and as yet unknowable role in politics and political discourse, and a president who uses wildly loose rhetoric against groups he sees as his quote unquote enemies, none more so than the mainstream press, and who exposes authoritarian tendencies when he calls the press quote the enemy of the people and threatens to quote change the libel laws, unquote. Or is this just a showbiz president from a reality TV pedigree who was in the right place at the right time? Post Iraq war, post Wall Street financial crisis, post European migration crisis, when it seemed the entire Western world was questioning the foundations of liberal democracy and the liberal world order. It's safe to say his more than 60 million voters care much less about what he says and how he says it than that he is shaking up institutions that they view as not just out of touch, but as operating against their interest. So perhaps when he needles the press, it's just part of the same hyperbole and exaggeration that helped him get elected and not an actual tangible threat to press freedoms themselves. And then when the press overreacts to his own exercise of free speech, coarse as it may be, it just plays right into his hands. So those are just a couple of questions I wanted to set up with tonight. Uh, and fortunately, I don't have to figure all this out. That's what we have this panel here for. Uh, and it really is an outstanding panel. I know you have their bios in your, um, your programs, but let me just give a, a bullet point or two on each. Uh, and they're all, most of them are working journalists. They were all doing stories today. <laughs> uh, some of them have bylines out this morning that I was reading and on TV today a couple of times. Um, so there, we have a great group here. Uh, John Avalon, and we, we, I have them all set alphabetically. We didn't really organize any set things for them to say. I wanted them just to sort of be themselves. So we're right to left uh, alphabetical in terms of uh, intros and also their presentations when we get to it. John Avalon is a senior political analyst at CNN, formerly editor-in-chief of the Daily Beast, formerly of the world of politics and communications. Uh, you can watch John every morning on the front lines of CNN's New Day, where he also does a very clever and insightful reality check segment. And his new book, uh, Washington's Farewell, The Founding Father's Warning to Future Generations is a must read to place much of this current era in historic context. James Freeman works at the Wall Street Journal's editorial page, which has a very important and independent voice in the current media environment. His daily best of the web column is also a must read, in my opinion, uh, covering politics, media, culture, <laughs> business, and the intersection of all of these things. His new book, Borrowed Time, Two Centuries of Booms, Busts, and Bailouts at City, also offers an important snapshot of the political climate that led to the rise of the Trump voter. Danielle Pletka has served in many different capacities uh, as a professional staffer on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as a vice president for foreign and defense policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute, where she currently works. And you can also see her as a regular panelist on the NBC Sunday show, Meet the Press, where she discusses both foreign policy and domestic politics and culture, and she's also a prolific writer with bylines seemingly everywhere. Jim Rutenberg has been writing about politics and media for more than 10 years now, mostly with the New York Times, where he currently serves as media columnist, writing enormously influential and insightful pieces on the current Trump era and media and politics in general, and I highly recommend his piece today uh, where he was down uh, Brownsville, Texas, on the border covering some issues relating to migrations. Uh, so that's our, that's, our, that's our panel. I want to welcome them for now, if we can. <clears throat> Thank you. So what we'll do is uh, each one of them, we're going to go, I'm going to go back to the table. We'll all speak for about, they'll speak for about 10 minutes, 12 minutes. Um, and then we might have some discussion time uh, with just the panelists. If they're engaged with each other, I might prompt them a little bit. And then I'll make sure before we end tonight, uh, we'll get some uh, solid time with the audience. You could ask whatever questions you want to whomever you want uh, or all of us. And we'll take it from there. So thanks so much. And I'll see you in a little bit. Just absolving himself of all responsibility. Uh, I have no responsibility <laughs> um, well, uh, it's it's an honor uh, to be here. Um, I uh, did some graduate work here at Columbia, so it's uh, a little like coming home. I've also been up since 3:45 in the morning, so um, I'm going to try to shake off the cobwebs and um, and and talk to you because it's a fascinating and, and really important topic. Um, 
you know, one of the big questions, uh, of course, is how much we can use the lens of history to judge our current times. Mark Twain once famously said, history doesn't repeat, but sometimes it rhymes. Um, which is why I think the fact that our president uses the phrase enemy of the people to refer to the free press um, is worth noting. It's not just that he's a hype man and speaking in uh, hyperbole or truthful hyperbole, as he would say from his time as a real estate magnate. Um, it's that that phrase is resonant through history, um, just not often in America. Um, uh, that is a phrase used to try to turn, obviously, people against the press. Um, it is to diminish and destroy the credibility of the press. Um, Donald Trump is not unique in thinking he is unfairly treated by the press. That tension is built into the system. Every president has felt they are unfairly treated by the press. Going back to George Washington, as Stu mentioned, I, I wrote a book about George Washington's farewell address. There was partisan media even then. But there was also a, a constant, calming, steadying awareness of the role and responsibility of a free press. I'm fond of pointing out that uh, the Constitution doesn't mention political parties, uh, but it does mention the press and freedom of the press. That's not an accident. Uh, this, a free press is part of the structure that the founders set in place. It is part of the system of checks and balances. It's fundamental, even more fundamental in their conception of how our society could work and how we could avoid going down the path that had destroyed democratic republics in the past than political parties. Um, James Madison, I think, summed it up particularly well. And he and John, uh, Thomas Jefferson helped found one of the first partisan presses, the Gazette of the United States, to attack the Washington administration in the first term. And um, uh, Madison said, to the press alone, checkered as it is with abuses, the world is indebted for all the triumphs which have been gained by reason and humanity over error and oppression. Checkered with abuses. It's a human enterprise. People make mistakes. The point is to admit them and learn from them. That is something the press does. Reason and humanity over error and oppression. It is an essential check and balance on a free society. Think of all the stories, even just in our own immediate time, that the powerful would not have wanted to find out. But the cause of truth and ultimately a more transparent, more functioning, more accountable society is guaranteed by the press doing its job. That debate has gone on at different times, as Stuart has said. But I don't think, in general, the core responsibility of a free press to a free society has been in the crosshairs quite as much. Um, usually, in, we look back in the lens of history, and that's a useful exercise, I find, even from back in my time in government. How will things look in the rearview mirror of history? We can do our best guess, but sometimes it's clarifying. The Sedition Act doesn't look good in the eyes of history. Uh, the Palmer Raids and the Red Scare don't look good in the Espionage Act. Um, and the entire sort of McCarthy era and that clamp down of the free press doesn't look good. Those are instructive. We should use that guide to help us see clear to our own time. The term fake news um, is, of course, bandied about a lot. And I think that's worth a quick drilling down. There is such a thing as fake news, or what we call it, in the context of the 2016 campaign. Right? And I think it's worth defining the term because it's been intentionally muddied. Uh, I sometimes like to say it's intentionally false stories written with the intent to deceive. Fundamentally false stories written with the intent to deceive. And people choose to profit either for propagandistic reasons or for actual pocketbook reasons. It proliferated, particularly in the late days of the 2016 election, to such an extent that because of the new medium of social media and search engines, Fake stories, fake news, rated higher than real news by credible outlets. That has a distorting effect on our democracy, uh, very much consistent with disinformation campaigns we saw throughout the Cold War. That's a problem we need to confront. Where it got even more troubling is the president took that term uh, under perhaps the anxiety or the allegation that fake news had aided his election. Um, all these things are up to debate and quantification. Uh, and decided to direct that term not at the thing it is, but at the free press and legacy media organizations, be it the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, maybe not the editorial page, no, I'm just kidding, um, and, uh, and CNN and other places. Um, that's dangerous. You know, when he says in he tweets in February of 2017, any negative polls you see are fake news. That's about pushing the boundaries of, of, of reality 
and trying to corral supporters to doubt that there is such a thing as objective truth. That's dangerous. That's a move we've seen in the past. He is capitalizing, however, on a real problem that journalists need to take a degree of responsibility for, a declining trust in the media over a period of time. Um, I would point to the declining trust in media, and Paul showed this, to the rise of partisan media. And uh, the real brief version of that story that I'd give is, right-wing uh, talk radio in particular was formed in the 1980s, um, around the time that the Fairness Doctrine was ditched, as a uh, attempt to correct what they saw as the unconscious bias, liberal bias of the mainstream media, and to correct it with a explicit bias. That began, became Fox News uh, with Roger Ailes, who'd been running a positive polarization play since he was a Nixon campaign aide in 1968. Um, that then uh, proliferates as we see media fragment. Um, all of a sudden, instead of this sort of wonderful opportunity for people to get more access to information than ever before, people start self-segregating themselves into separate political realities. Um, that has a negative effect on the trust in news. We are more fragmented, you know, and people who hope that Uncle Walt's gonna come down and say that's the way it is, that's not gonna happen because of innovations in technology. But it gets to such a place that even in the middle of the last decade, well before Donald Trump, um, you see a decline in trust in all news organizations. Do, uh, John Stewart's famously named America's most trusted newsman. And uh, <laughs> declining support of the uh, belief in the accuracy of C-SPAN is on decline. This is significant, of course, because it's unedited raw footage and people are literally saying they don't believe what they see with their own eyes. Um, so that is a, a reminder that Donald Trump is in many ways uh, a symptom and not the cause of the situation we're in. But he has consciously exacerbated many of these impulses. Um, taken the tension between the presidency and the press um, and turned it into something different, trying to exacerbate declining trust by really saying that there are different realities um, and, and taking that fight full on. In the context of a global pushback of liberal democracy, and notably autocrats around the world picking up the phrase fake news from the American president to legitimize their own attempts uh, to cut down on the free press or to silence stories they might want not to be out there, whether it's uh, you know, the Rohingya in Myanmar to Vladimir Putin to Assad. That is not a good sign given the role that America plays, I think, as a beacon of freedom in a city on a hill. Um, so these are all things to be concerned of. And in that fragmentation, the problem is, what I think some folks don't fully appreciate is that it's a business model. It's just that crass and craven. For some people, it's a matter of principle. For other folks, uh, it's called cocooning. And basically, in a fragmented media environment, you want to appeal to a narrow but intense niche audience. And you keep them addicted through anger and anxiety and agitation, usually directed at the other. Republican Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska writes beautifully about this in his new book, Think. It's been written about before. Um, so that means it becomes kind of a, a, a con, if you will, uh, for some people. The proliferation of fake news and hate news always trying to get a more hyper-partisan strain out there. And indeed, even Fox News needs to protect its right flank, often, with new folks who come up and say, you know, we're going to give you even more um, ideologically driven news, although um, very often it's not actually about a philosophy or an idea. It's about tribes. And that's where I think we get into the real trouble we are today. It's the tribalism in American politics that's being exacerbated um, by trying to condemn us to separate realities. And the calling card of the demagogue always is us against them. Um, and, and we need to resist that because that is the opposite of the idea of America, e pluribus unum, out of many one. The problem is that right now we're in a jump ball moment. Abraham Lincoln said, uh, allegedly, uh, I'm an optimist because I don't see the point in being anything else. Um, and I do think that we will get past this moment. But I don't think you can diminish the seriousness, nor do I think you should over uh, correct for it. By which I mean, I think it's vitally important that the news media remains, when I was editor-in-chief of the Daily Beast, would say nonpartisan but not neutral. Right? That means we have an obligation to be a corrective to the problem we see if you believe that partisan media is part of the problem. That means you need to be able to hit and willing to hit both sides where appropriate, but also not to pretend there's a mythic moral equivalence on every issue, because that on the one side, on the other, has the impact itself of muddying the distinctions between fact and fiction. 
I think one of the great key quotes of our time is from Daniel, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who said, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. And it's part of our responsibility as journalists to insist upon a fact-based debate. That doesn't mean we can't have great debates, but we need to make sure they're rooted in facts, honest differences of opinion that maybe stem from principle and not from um, an us against them uh, impulse that divides America deeper. This is a challenge of our time. And right now, one of the ways you can tell it's a real challenge and not simply something that's ginned up um, is that the Quinnipiac put out a poll in August of this year showing that 26% of Americans believe the press is the enemy of the people and notably 51% of Republicans. I wouldn't hang your hat on that, but it's evidence of a, of a certain asymmetric polarization that we need to deal with. And I've always said politics follows the lines of physics. Every action creates an equal and opposite reaction. So watch out. Um, but I think that if the press focuses on doing its job, and that doesn't mean uh, pretending uh, that we don't have a perspective rooted in the facts, that we do have an obligation not to be simply a stenographer for people in power, but when a lie or a mistruth is stated, we have an obligation to correct that. That's part of our job as well as saying what happened today. That's a line we need to walk, and it's constantly recalibrated every day. But I think if we do that, if we insist on a fact-based debate, if we aim for our best, you know, what, what Carl Bernstein would say as um, the best obtainable version of the truth, if we try to be nonpartisan but not neutral on every issue, I think we can play the role that the founders intended for us. We will not please everybody, and we would be a fool to try. But I think it would also be foolish to dismiss out of hand for reasons of expediency, partisan, political, or profit, uh, the, the real challenge we face and the way it departs, um, I think, from our best traditions in that constant balance and tension between politicians and the press. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. And, and I'm, uh, James Friedman will go next, and I'm now glad he's going before Danielle. So, James, please. Okay. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, appreciate the. Uh... Uh, the opportunity to be here. It's an honor to speak to you and appreciate the kind words in the introduction. Uh, also, uh, before I delve into the topic, I have a little news you may be able to use. Uh, I just so happened to uh, uh, get a tip on a, a, an issue at uh, pizza gatherings in grad school, which is that if you find the uh, crowd is too big for the amount of pizza, I've heard, and I'm not endorsing this, but I recently heard that some people will take one slice and then put the pizza box on the floor <laughs> so that other people won't take it and then they'll come back and, and get uh, as much as they like. We so test that theory. Yeah, I, again, I, I don't know if it's an issue here at Columbia or on other campuses, but uh, just something to keep in mind. Um, the, uh, so here we are uh, almost uh, two years into the Trump era, and uh, I think this would be a good time uh, as we talk about uh, uh, the press uh, considering mistakes, learning from mistakes, um, to think about whether the uh, decision that I think many people in our industry made in 2016 to treat uh, Donald Trump differently from other candidates and to apply a different standard and to decide that he is an authoritarian, I, I think that idea uh, would would uh, is what is one that they, that uh, they should reflect on because um, uh, when we talk about an authoritarian, we now have again a couple of years track <laughs> record. Um, we have a uh, president who has had a lot of harsh words for the press, uh, but also one who has. Uh, vastly limited the federal government's control over communications. The, uh, on communications policy, the, the signature uh, move of the Trump era is to uh, repeal net neutrality regulation. Now, I know people have lots of different views on, on to what extent the federal government ought to oversee the internet and regulate it. Um, but uh, uh, Stuart mentioned the communications networks of the 1930s, uh, the previous administration chose to apply the 1930s telecom regulation uh, to the internet. Very uh, 
very great expansion of federal power, I think, whether you agreed with it or not. Um, that was a, a, uh, a, a really important moment in terms of Washington exercising much more control over communications. President Trump's appointee at the FCC has, and, and the other commissioners have overturned that. So in other words, this is a, a very great uh, uh, relinquishing of power by the federal government over communications. I would say authoritarians never do that. I think if you look through your history of authoritarians, you will not find one who reduces government control over communications. I think also it's important, I, I think words are important. Obviously, I, the line of work I've chosen, I must think they're important, but, uh, but actions matter too. And so I think it's important to note that while the president is offering a lot of harsh words for his adversaries, critics, opponents in the press, um, the, uh, what we see, is, as uh, John described, is a thriving media market. His critics are thriving. They're not being thrown in jail. They're, they're not being uh, uh, deported, uh, uh, you know, harassed uh, for, for the act of uh, journalism. Uh, now, I think you, it wasn't reported as much. The, the previous administration was quite active in, in surveillance, uh, the Associated Press and others. I, I think you have a tough case to make if you say, forget the rhetoric, let's look at the facts to say Trump is worse than Obama in terms of press freedom. And this brings us to the, the First Amendment issue. First Amendment does not say the government, the president cannot criticize people in the press. It says he can't restrict their freedom. Again, we have a very vibrant, active market in Trump criticism. He, he jokes about it at, uh, at various press conferences about how, how good he is for the business of his critics. They're not, they're not suffering, they're, they're thriving. And, and I think we, we heard uh, through American history, this is, this is not unique where you have an active uh, uh, rhetorical battle going on between, uh, between the president um, and the press. Um, also, I, I would note that uh, the other uh, party, the Democratic Party, has uh, in important ways recommended what you might call a significant editing of the Bill of Rights. Obviously, the Second Amendment, but, but on, the, on the First Amendment as well, the, the signature issue for, um, for the uh, Democratic candidate in 2016, uh, or one of them, I should say, was a rewrite of the Citizens United decision, which specifically allowed someone to make and distribute a film about Hillary Clinton. So she was... She was arguing that that film should not have been allowed to be distributed. I think that is, like it or not, a more significant uh, revision of the First Amendment than anything I can, I can think of with, with President Trump. I, I don't know what First Amendment rewrite he has proposed. I, if he has, I'm not aware of it. Is there a lot of harsh language toward people in the press? Yes. Um, I think there is some fairly uh, harsh, uh, hostile coverage of him. Um, fake news, you know, I, in terms of uh, people in the press kind of re reviewing their, um, their possible mistakes, I, I think it's a, uh, a little bit of a dodge to say that fake news can only occur uh, among anonymous uh, hackers on the internet and not at an established media firm. Um, I don't go around labeling stuff fake news as a general core matter, but I think if you have a television program, for example, and you have a panel of non-doctors issuing medical diagnoses on the mental health of someone they have not examined, I don't think you can complain if people call that fake news. And I, so I'm not, I think, uh, I think as, as harsh as the president's rhetoric can be at times, it's, uh, it's worth considering um, whether, uh, whether his treatment is pretty harsh, too. Um, yeah, one more thing, I just in terms of this authoritarian uh, idea. So um, 
the president has had a lot of success seating uh, judges, obviously uh, Judge Kavanaugh now, Justice Kavanaugh, but also at the, uh, at the circuit and appellate level. So what you see there is a um, consistent effort, a successful effort to seat judges who are constitutionalists, who generally uh, recognize strict limits on the exercise of federal power. I don't know why an authoritarian would want to do that. That is, that is not what authoritarians do. Authoritarians want a judiciary that, that does not limit the power of the central government. So I, I, uh, I understand how harsh the rhetoric is, uh, but I think the, the action has is, is been good for journalism, good for a vibrant, loud media market. Um, and I should say, as we sit here almost two years into the, the Trump administration, um, it's a little odd sometimes to read stories sort of pondering whether this guy would be a suitable president. Um, we, we do have to acknowledge that his signature uh, agenda item to revive the American economy, uh, that, that program appears to be working. Now, we could argue whether, I know some people don't think this will last, and they, they think uh, um, they're skeptical that this boom in uh, business investment we've seen is going to be sustained for years and years to come. Uh, maybe they're skeptical that this jobs market and the U.S. competitiveness will be as good next year and the year after as it is now. But I think there ought to be some uh, recognition that uh, so far the program appears to be having some success. And I also um, just, uh, I don't know if I'm droning on here, but the, uh, Not yet. Um, I think the, uh, <laughs> I, I think it, it may be easy to dismiss a, a vibrant economy as, as less important than other values, but I, I think what, I think it allows us to, to exercise lots of values and it has huge moral implications for the world, whether the United States or China, still controlled by a communist dictatorship, is the world's largest economy. I think I'll stop there. Thanks, James. I Thanks. think people will have questions for you a little later. Good. So we'll uh, can, you know, have some more time. Uh, let's move on to Danielle Pleka. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. It's always good to follow communist dictatorship. Everything is up from there. <laughs> um, thank you. You know, I'm here under completely false pretenses. First of all, it's really an honor for me to be sitting here with, OK, Stuart, who I've known a really long time. And these three gentlemen, all of whom are actual bona fide, uh, fide, fide journalists. I am a former journalist um, and, uh, and, and a talking head on television, which doesn't really make me a, a journalist at all. It just makes me someone who talks a lot on television. Um, <laughs> and there's no shortage of us, as I'm sure you are all aware. So I think it's important when we talk about these sorts of issues to start with um, to start with how things are different, because there are a lot of tropes about the, the Trump administration that are probably a little bit unfairly saddled on Donald Trump just because he is president in 2016. And this is a, this is a, it's a very interesting era, not from the standpoint of all of the things that we love to talk about and gossip about and argue about, but just from the standpoint of, of, of information, technology, and social media. Um, so I'm looking around at the crowd. Thank you so much for not making me the oldest person here, which I so often am. Um, but I think that a lot of, a, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of the folks who you teach um, and who I teach at Georgetown uh, as well, don't actually have a keen understanding of what it was like um, to grow up before the age of popular social media. Um, you know, when I grew up, and I grew up in Boston, um, we got the Boston Globe, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. And we got commentary, so just in case you were wondering what my politics were, and, uh, and the New Republic, and maybe the New York Review of Books. And, and what did that mean? You know, most of our neighbors got those papers too. Okay? So we actually, we all read those papers differently. 
We all saw them through a particular lens and analyzed their content through a particular prism. I couldn't stand the Boston Globe, still can't. Um, but we had a common frame of reference, right? We all saw that story. The Boston Globe was not curating stories for me on my street and then writing a different story for the guy on the street above me who had a different interest. And that's really where I think we have begun to diverge, is that we are actually not talking uh, about the same facts anymore. And um, there's a, a broad belief, I, I know, in the news media and elsewhere that, um, that curated news is somehow not real news and that it is uh, sinful to cater to people's interests and that people are uh, somehow tribalizing themselves. I'm going to come back to that much despised and overused word in a moment. But that, um, but that this is a bad thing. And I would say, from the standpoint of not having a common frame of reference, that is a bad thing. It's good for us to have an ability to talk about the same kinds of things and understand and have a commonality of understanding. On the other hand, uh, more information is not bad information. <clears throat> And I think that we, it would be very hard to disagree with the notion that now we have more information. Yes, it's true. People do absolutely <coughs> tailor what they read. Uh, I can still remember looking back a couple of elections ago and being really surprised by the results. And I realized um, that I had actually just been reading things I wanted to read that were telling me that things were going to be better than they actually were going to be, and they weren't. And I was a little bit surprised, actually, when things didn't come out the way they were. Well, you know, I, I hope I'm self-aware enough to understand that I actually had made a mistake in the sourcing of my information. I think a lot of people uh, view that somehow as a <coughs> betrayal. Oh my God, I thought Hillary Clinton was going to win the election. She didn't win the election. The election must have been stolen. And the answer is, well, actually, that's not a thing. That's not right. Maybe you were just reading the wrong information. And, and that's a, a reasonable question and something that I think those of us who spend a lot of time you know, talking um, don't serve our, uh, those who are listening to us uh, well enough by suggesting, actually, you know, you're really just not educating yourself very well. Um, you are actually fooling yourself. You need a diversity of information. You need to read things that are, are different. That's not enough of a press. And I think that when you look at the newspapers of, of record, and you know, for me, it's the, it's the, the New York Times, it's the Wall Street Journal, um, and it's the Financial Times, actually, which I still think is a very good newspaper, um, there's not enough of a, a, of a press in that regard. Now, this is all very boring and, and, and thoughtful, and I'm, I apologize for being boring and thoughtful for, for for a moment. Um, but I do think that it's a, a, a good conversation, and I work at a think tank, and we try and be boring and thoughtful just occasionally, you know, because we're a 501c3. But um, part of what all of this conversation about new information and curated information and, uh, and looking to your own sources of information in order to bolster your worldview and the worldview of your neighbors and your friends and your families is, um, is that news has always been biased. Okay. Um, this is not a new thing. You know, when I was first a, a, a journalist and I had just gotten out of, I just gotten out of uh, college and my, my boss who worked for the Los Angeles Times, I was a, a, a local hire, a gopher for him. And he said, you know, we are, we are objective news gatherers. And I thought, complete crap. What are you talking about? I know you have biases. I hear what you ask people. You may try and do a good job in reporting, but the people you go to to ask the questions of, your go-to sources reflect your biases. I see this as a source with the questions that I get asked. Okay? The notion that a journalist is somehow pure, like a priest, uh, that, that John, I think, uh, somehow suggested, maybe gently and not quite as forcefully as I just did, is rubbish. Okay? Journalists are people just like the rest of us. Okay? And they may try to be fair. Okay? They may talk to someone on the right and someone on the left. But at the end of the day, they are talking to the people who they know. And that is like looking for your keys in the street lamp. I hate to tell you. 
So there is, there has always been bias. There will always be bias. And you know, um, most of us, at, thank God, I'm in New York. I can actually finally use a New York reference. Um, remember Pauline Kael? Uh, she was the film critic of The New Yorker. She has, uh, I don't even know if she's still alive. I, sus I suspect not. Um, right, not, we never agreed with her film critiques either. But in this case, in 1972, she very famously said, I can't believe Richard Nixon won the election. I don't know a soul who voted for him. Okay, Pauline, maybe that's the problem. Because guess what? He was elected president of the United States. And you fast the forward. United States. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, he, did, he was lucky in his opponent, to be fair. But this is what we now find. Fast forward, you know, 50 years. And this is, this is what we find now as well, is that plenty of journalists don't understand how it is that Donald Trump could have been elected. And it must have been a bunch of know-nothing, knuckle-dragging, gun-toting, God-loving, scumbag, trailer-living Southerners who elected him. And that's not true. That's not how our system works. And again, we do a disservice to, we do a disservice to voters and to our democracy, but we also do a disservice to the, the very news goals that are meant to be served by failing to represent that there are people out there who don't think these things, who aren't actually from Boston and New York and Washington, <coughs> like all of us, or Los Angeles, or San Francisco, or Portland, or Seattle, like all of them, but are actually real people with real interests that aren't actually terribly well reflected. And those people got mad, and those people voted for Donald Trump. Okay, Now, I didn't vote for Donald Trump, just in the, in the complete, that's the nice thing about not being a journalist. I can tell you how I voted. I didn't vote for Donald Trump. You didn't I, vote for Hillary. I'll I didn't vote that. for Hillary either, uh, just in case that remained a mystery. Um, but but I, wanna, I wanna pinpoint something, because you brought up Kavanaugh, and we've talked a little bit, and uh, James talked a little bit about Kavanaugh. Um, so I'm not a big fan of the press is the enemy of the people, uh, fake news, you know, uh, you know, nice statements about Erdogan or, or Putin or anything else. Um, those, are, those are not things that I love. Um, but on the, I had just been out of town during the Kavanaugh hearings, and I came back into town, and I opened up the newspaper because I wanted to catch up a little bit. Okay, and I took a picture of this, and I, I made a beautiful collage, and I put it up on Twitter. Okay, here's what the papers, this, these were the papers on my couch. I didn't go looking for them. I get, I get the regular papers. Okay, when your rapist is your, when your friend is your rapist, will China hack the U.S. midterms? A complete national disgrace. A supreme violation. From Harvey Weinstein to Brett Kavanaugh in one exhausting year. Trump and the aristocracy of fraud. How Brett Kavanaugh failed. A young activist's advice: vote, shave your head, and cry whenever you need to. Kavanaugh is one more step in America's cycle of self-destruction. The Trump administration just reset the U.S.-China relationship. Duh, we need to see Trump's tax returns, but that's just the first step. No op-ed can clean up the Kavanaugh mess. We were Brett Kavanaugh's drinking buddies. We don't think he should be confirmed. I've known Brett Kavanaugh his entire professional life. It would be an honor to address him as justice. The outlier. Trump is making a mockery of more than just one assault. And here's a cartoon, when men testify versus when women testify. Yeah, these were the op-ed pages of the, of, that were sitting on my couch, okay? Now, I'm not a rabid, you know, gun-toting, God-loving, trailer-living Trump voter, okay? That's offensive. This is, this is offensive. That's a lack of balance, okay? 95%. This is crazy. And this is where journalists don't see how offended people are by this. Okay. Because I don't want to have to go and look for, you know, on red state to find news. I don't want to have to go to National Review to find the other news. I like reading the New York Times. I like reading the Washington Post. I can't see those that balance in these, and that's a huge problem. Then there's the other denigration of those of us who, uh, who don't see things from the perspective of the left, by journalists, but by others, and that is the word tribal. We're tribalists. Now, what does that mean? 
That means that we're white people who want to be with other white people, okay? Just in case you needed a translation for what tribal means. It doesn't mean you're a proud Honduran American or African American or any other hyphenated American that's become so popular. What it means is you, disgraceful white people who are tribalists, don't respect other people and the tribes we've self-designated as, okay? That's not okay. That word is code language Okay, to attack people who disagree. And it is, it is reflexive, it has become a part of everyday dialogue, it has become a part of everything I hear on, in the press, and it is enormously offensive. Yeah, I have one minute, I know. Stuart was worried that I was gonna <laughs> yell at everybody. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna pull up one last thing, two last things on foreign policy, because that's actually what I know something about as opposed to this particular little rant, which is just my, per my personal perspective. Um, let's take two things. One, the coverage of the Iran deal. The last time I spoke at, uh, at Columbia, Stuart and I talked about the Iran deal. Um, President Obama's advisors made very clear and spoke publicly about their creation of a so-called echo chamber among the press and its sources in Washington. I have not seen an iota of self-examination in the press about that echo chamber that was created about the Iran deal and whether the Iran deal was a good thing. Now as it happens, I don't think it was a good deal. I don't think it was the greatest sin ever committed by a president who was secretly a Muslim and wanted to help Hezbollah. Don't get me wrong. But I don't think that it was the unmitigated bit of success that the press represented it as. Now, let's fast forward a second and I want to ask you about something you've seen in the paper. Okay? Khashoggi, okay? the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Have you seen it in the press? Has it been covered? I think it's been covered kind of a lot. Okay. Do you know how many people have died in Syria? Half a million. Okay. Do you know there's a Washington Post stringer that's being held by Iranian proxies in Syria and has been for five years, Austin Tice? Do you know there's a Pakistani blogger who was abducted by his government and disappeared? Do you know where the head of Interpol is? Yeah, he's gotten an article. One, not on the front page. Okay. It is impossible. And again, you know, I know I, I know <clears throat> Jamal Khashoggi. This is an outrage. We can talk about it all you want, although that's not our subject tonight. But the but the overrepresentation of that in the media is not about him. It's about Donald Trump. And that is the problem. Over to you. Wow. Jim has to follow um, that. <laughs> yeah. Last. Uh, <coughs> Matt and I just wanna, <clears throat> Before I go, I just want to say there's um, Brett Stevens is grateful for Trump after Kavanaugh defense. There is the Democrats are blowing it by death. Brett Stevens. I mean, I think there are some. I, I think you know. I think one day. Okay. Well. I mean, I get that. Right. One day Brett isn't Stevens. represent. Well, whatever. I'm just saying it's not represent. It's also. I mean, you have David Brooks too. Yeah. But so, of course they uh, hate Trump. Both of them. I am here as the. Um, non-politician or political person. I don't have a background in that. Um, and so my, the way I approach this is a little bit different. I grew up as a daily news reporter for the Daily News and the New York Post. Um, I got my break with, by a, with a story that, um, a, that was entitled <coughs> Columbia's Dark Secret. It was about heroin use on this campus. Sorry, folks. <laughs> but it got me hired uh, by the New York Post. Um, and for me, this has all been interesting. Um, because when you grew up covering news in this city back then, uh, especially city news, it was fires and transit and crime. And I was a subway beat reporter at the Daily News. And you know, my thing was like, just beat the crap out of them every day. That was my job. They deserved it. They deserved it every day, no matter what was happening. We know that now. Um, and it wasn't, I wasn't thinking that this is, it wasn't about big government and this should be private. It just wasn't in that, we weren't living in that lens here. Maybe other people were other places. Um, I moved from the Daily News to the New York Observer where Peter Kaplan, who's now deceased, was our editor, and he said uh, it was the end of the millennium, it was the, 1990, the very last week of 1999, and he said, let's go with the most important New Yorkers and spend time with them. The people are gonna matter the most in the next century. And I was sent to Roger Ailes' office. 
Um, and Ailes didn't open his office to, to many people, and I guess I was a little bit rube-like because he was asking me about my politics, and I was like, okay, I don't know, I covered, I, I used to cover the subways. I've been hired, actually, when the, when the observer called me, they said, cover TV as if it's a subway system, which made sense later, anyway. <laughs> um, and, you know, that was my kind of introduction, was hanging out with Roger Ailes, and I think half of what was going on in that room was over my head, but I do think that we saw a shift in the way news was viewed. And when, I, when you look at what Fox did, Roger Ailes had his opening for good reason. Um, when, you, when I watch old network news, sort of pre-Fox, and even like pre-90s, there are things that you can see it is definitely, it's leaning left in a different way. I mean, it's very left. There's, <clears throat> it's sort of like there was a need for some alternative, mm -hmm. right? And excuse me, I've got a little bit of a cold. <clears throat> so there was a good opening. Roger Ailes took advantage of it. Um, I do think that things now have come to a whole different level. Um, so that's what I spend my days sort of struggling with. What is the right way for the, pro the press to approach this? What is fair? What isn't fair? Uh, I do think that, um, and I think I'd like to get to the questions faster because I don't have a big spiel on this. I've also spent the last 10 months covering Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal, so I'm just coming back to this now. <laughs> but, um, but I do think that there are some things that I don't know if I would say that the rhetoric is just harmless uh, when it's anti-press because we did just have to put police barricades in front of our building for the first time. Um, I do think that um, the bending of facts sometimes go goes beyond what we've seen before. Uh, I would quote uh, the Wall Street Journal editorial that said, yet the president clings to his assertions like a drunk to an empty gym bottle. I'd never seen the Wall Street Journal write that about a Republican president. So I do think that there's a, there, when, during the campaign, we talked about this a lot, he was treated differently, um, as Mr. Freeman said, but he was a different candidate. I think he'd be the first person to say he's different. And he, so that did require some different ways to think about it and write about it. Now I will say that it all has to do with the facts, the basics have to matter. Uh, you can't, there's, there can be too much emotion. There can be too much partisanship. Uh, but at the same time, in this, this time of, um, you know, there's a bumper sticker that was bouncing around Twitter yesterday, make yourself feel better, punch a journalist. Um, and there's this sort of idea that all journalists are crazy, anti-Trump, zealots and you know i know my friends are journalists and they are out there in the country talking to people I, no one said to me anything about those redneck idiots like i don't i don't hear that language in my newsroom and well i i don't i just disagree i mean my friends are out there trying to understand the country this is definitely a different presidency it just is and um so we're trying to capture that we're trying to capture it fairly um, but I've noticed, and I'm just kind of coming back into my column, so I'm trying to get my head around all of this, but I see things happening, and this isn't to do a both sides as a version of this, but you know, uh, you can watch MSNBC at night, and you can see their audience going down rabbit holes because they want to believe certain things, and the facts aren't there to support them. So if we all just stick to the facts, do things methodically, you know, I was part of the, the way I got drawn out of my column was I was covering the Harvey Weinstein story. I was pulled in to, to do that story. And the Harvey Weinstein story hit in a huge way, but it hit in a huge way for a reason. It was incredibly well reported. Um, and but my colleagues Jody Cantor and Megan Tui did, did the first story. And it was just established five ways to Sunday. It was eight months of work. It was very, very solid. And it had the effect, the Kavanaugh coverage you didn't have that. And I think that's when people don't understand why certain stories didn't stick. There, the corroboration wasn't there. Maybe that corroboration would have shown up eight months later or six months later. Maybe it wouldn't have. So, um, you know, anyone who is defending the press and doesn't like hearing fake news should be ready to have their own uh, notions challenged when the facts don't line up for them as well. So, again, to me, it all goes back to basics. Um, let me see if there's any other point that I want to hit before I give it up. Um, no, I think, why don't we just go into it? Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate that. Sure. Um, you'll notice I, we put together a panel where you were getting different viewpoints. Having a panel with everyone saying the same thing that you hear every day 
isn't going to do anyone any good. This is a panel to make you think, have people defend their positions, challenge each other, and I want the audience to think like that also when you start asking uh, some questions. But first, um, let me see if, if I, I know you all, I mean, a lot of different viewpoints here. Uh, if any, any of the panelists want to directly engage any other panelists, now would be the time. John Avalon, unsur unsurprisingly, has his, sword, his pen and sword ready to go. Um, first of all, I would just ask uh, all of us, well, particularly the conservative uh, papers, and look, we should have great disagreements. We should have great debates. Um, but imagine for a second that Hillary Clinton was president and she was invoking enemy of the people and calling for libel laws and you know increasing deficit and debt and, and what the POV would be. I, I, I think it would be a little less sanguine if the economy was doing just as well. Um, to the diversity of opinion point, um, I think every news organization needs to make a great effort to have, especially and particularly on the opinion section, um, a more robust debate, and I do think that actually uh, what James Bennett has done at the Times has gotten a lot of flack for, uh, very often bring on Brett Stevens and Barry Weiss, and you hear that, but, but I actually, those are great decisions. Uh, now, people on the right don't consider them right enough, and yet people on the left very often want to censure them for their opinions. That, to me, you know, is, is evidence of an attempt to pull away from the groupthink, which I think degrades our discourse. Um, we do have a tendency to live in bubbles. I think very often they're geographic. They're not red state, blue state. They're very often urban, rural. Um, you know, my folks live in South Carolina and have for more than 30 years. My grandparents who just passed live in Youngstown, Ohio. I've spent a, I spent a lot of time in those places. And um, it is incredibly valuable to get out of New York and LA and Washington and not confuse those conversations with the nations. Uh, on the other hand, um, I, I think, uh, if a sin is committed by journalists, it's that they too often, as we've seen local outlets uprooted by economic dislocation and thinned out, which is a problem that goes back decades. Um, first the commodification in local news, then the degradation in now business models that are failing. That increases the alienation uh, that can exist in communities for, for the free press. And we have an obligation to not you know, parachute in and treat these folks anthropologically, but it's also a big mistake to think there's a fundamental hostility uh, when reporters who are not opinionators go and, and talk to these folks. Um, and, and, and all the stereotypes break down. You know, Hillary Clinton, for example, won most of the cities of the South. That's not, you know, that, that is a more nuanced view of the divisions in our society. Frankly, I would argue they're more rural and versus urban than they are simply the character of the country, uh, your country changes when you cross the Mason-Dixon line. Um, but bubbles are something to be aware of. Diversity of opinion is something to be constantly striven for, but it also has to be rooted in something more than feelings. We should be insisting on a fact-based debate. One final point I'd make just with regard to Dan Danielle. There may be some people who do uh, use tribalism in a coded way, but because I did introduce that phrase, uh, let me say um, that I don't consider it all code for white people. Um, in any way, shape, or form. I think the larger issue of tribalism that's afflicting our nation is one of identity politics, um, which it can, it can affect folks on any side of the political spectrum. And if you don't think that's a, a weakness that's being exploited, take a look at where, the, for example, the Russians purchased a lot of their uh, you know, fake news propaganda on platforms like Facebook. They were not, they were and, and continue to be just trying to pull the classic disinformation move of inflaming divisions by appealing to tribal identities that are far left as well as far right. Um, so I, I do think that that's worth reflecting on and it's not simply a cudgel that's being used. I think, but the fact that they are identifying that as a weakness to exploit in our nation, I think speaks to the danger of those sorts of, uh, of, those sorts of identity politics. Um, where we start viewing our country through the lens of us against them. So that would just be my brief rejoinder to... Thank you. Uh, you referenced a few other people. See if anybody wants to jump, jump in on that. James? Um, well, I guess uh, just um, uh, another thing. I think uh, the, the press might uh, appreciate about this president if he... Um, 
um, if there wasn't kind of a focus on uh, this sort of a relentless uh, uh, daily battle is the, uh, the amount of um, unfiltered communication that comes from him. Um, now, you absolutely, know, it's uh, for real. Yeah. it's it's really remarkable. I, I, you know, you could judge or not whether you think it's uh, it's all true or all not true or somewhere in the middle or what have you. But the um, this uh, sort of uh, tweet uh, stream of consciousness, uh, a lot of it uh, I wouldn't agree with. Other people wouldn't agree with. Some people would agree with it. But um, but one thing you I think we can say is that it is not uh, it has not been honed and massaged and, and considered by a building full of public relations uh, experts. So um, I think it's uh, maybe an underreported uh, uh, benefit to the free exchange of ideas into a free press. And, um, and, uh, and I think he probably has, uh, has changed the game a bit. I'd be uh, surprised if the next president uh, doesn't have to be a little more accessible um, I also just, uh, as people have pointed out, uh, when the president does things and says things that uh, he shouldn't or we don't think he should, then we call him out on it. That's that's absolutely right, um, and uh, and I think that's our job. But uh, but also to to laud him when he does do things that are positive and and says things that are positive. I think that's uh, that's appropriate, and that's uh, what everyone in our industry should be should be trying to do every day. Can I just add one humorous aside about that? Well, maybe it's not humorous. You'd be, be the judge. But um, we would spend so much time when I covered Bush trying to figure out what is he thinking, the editors. What is he thinking? You know, it's right, been right. weeks. What is he thinking? And uh, we were at the G7, or was it G8, uh, in St. Petersburg in 2007, and the Russians leaked, um, leaked some audio of, of President Bush talking to Hu Jintao. And uh, what we learned was that he was hungry. <laughs> so we would have liked <laughs> tweeting. By the way, uh, in Bob Woodward's book, he has a thing about um, that Trump, who I, I understand this is, it's not by mistake that these tweets go out, and some of them hit and some of them don't. But he's his own sort of master on a lot of these things. And, uh, and the ones that he thinks works the best, apparently he has his staff blow up into these big supersized things and he studies each of the words and tries to think about what to do with them in the future. And I think, in, you know, the next, he, this is revolutionary. And this is a way he's communicating with tens of millions of people. Um, and the next president or presidents to come are, are going to try to figure out how to tame this beast of Twitter and social media. Well, look, no it's question. Yeah. Yeah, there's no question he's used social media in a different and, and revolutionary way than past presidents. And presidents get credit when they master new medium, right? FDR and radio, JFK and Reagan with TV. Um, but I would say there's a difference between the sort of um, uh, um, radical transparency that uh, Twitter can provide in terms of his state of mind at any given moment and um, real accessibility, which would be press conferences where he takes questions from the press. That is a That is a... I think not so subtle and very important difference. Well, I mean, lately, I don't think you could count a lot of formal press conferences, but what he's doing, I would argue, are maybe better for the, uh, the purpose of informing the public and allowing journalists to do that. He, he's been doing a lot of impromptu, kind of unscripted conversations with uh, reporters lately, whether it's uh, leaving, the, leaving the White House, uh, uh, he was, um, I guess, on a tarmac in Nevada on uh, Nevada on uh, Saturday, um, and uh, I think those are are better than a the carefully uh, planned, orchestrated uh, event. In but many I, ways, I would, I think, all access is great. So the great, but the thing about press conferences, and I'm sure you know it from your newsroom, and um, when there's a there's going to be a big presidential press conference. The reporters at all the organizations gather what they think are the most important topics. They prepare. They come in with their questions. That they they know this is the presence there, and we're going to be able to ask X, Y, and Z. Oftentimes, in those pool sprays, it could be someone filling in who's in the pool who doesn't really cover the beat. So there's something to be said. And just my bias as the media columnist at my newspaper is press conferences. We like them, and I think they're good for the country, and they're good for the presidency, and they're definitely good for the press. Danny, you have, want to jump in on this? No, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm, I, you know, it's very hard. Um, I think that Trump, Trump has obviously, you know, Trump has obviously shown himself in a 
in a terribly unattractive light by being so accessible. Um, and at the same time, you know, the press has not shown itself in a, in, a, in a hugely flattering light over the last couple of years, although I think there are some, some important exceptions, you know, Maggie Haberman at the, at the Times and, and, uh, and a lot of others who have really done uh, outstanding reporting. The problem is that, um, is that tr in some ways Trump has set reporters and the press up in their own minds as, as, as the most virtuous body. You know, just simply by treating it as a as a monolith, um, he has allowed uh, others to define this as, uh, as 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 somehow the arbiter of what facts are, <clears throat> and the arbiter of what truth is. And uh, that that's that's not true. Actually, individuals get to be the arbiters of uh, of of facts and truth, uh, mm -hmm. not the people who are chosen by you know. Um, I won't pick anyone who's here. Jeff Bezos. Um, and so, you know, it's, a, it's just a, it's complex. It's something hard to think about rather than, I don't think there's a straight answer here. But, but do you think that um, when Sorry. counter, when either, and I think lie is a, is a, you have to be very careful to using that word, but so when incorrect facts and perhaps sometimes lies, but incorrect facts are um, coming forth from the presidential lectern or from a pool spray or in a speech or in a tweet, then isn't it journalism's job to say, and short one to talk, that, hey, that's not true. And sure. our job is, like, that's what we dedicated, not 10 years, thank you very much, 25, though I'll, take, I'll lose 15 <laughs> I said, years. No, I said more than 10 yeah. years, just for the record. No. Um, um, I, I mean, I, I do think that's important. Um, I, I do think that's important, although I think some of it is sort of self-foiling, you know? When the president says, there were more people at my inauguration, and we can see there weren't. When he says, you know, the, the economy has never been this big, and the answer is, well, yeah, it has. You know, this is, I mean, you know, these are sort of facts that are self-evident. Um, and, and yes, the president is, is lying, and I don't think that, I, I don't think those are, those are questions of, a, of opinion. Um, and so that, that's hard. The problem is there's so much else. Um, that that isn't, um, and we haven't talked about a lot of these contentious issues, but where actually the facts that are being presented as facts by the press are not facts. Um, uh, the question, for example, of Russian collusion, um, it, it, you know, again, uh, I don't have much doubt that Donald Trump probably would have happily taken Russian help had it been proffered to him usefully. Um, but I'm not sure that it was. And if I only read the newspapers, I would think that it was an established fact. I don't mm -hmm. think that our news coverage is, would say it's, again, no, it's, it's, it wouldn't, it's, right? It's like your, it's, your, you know, uh, or, again. Or mo uh, like straight news reporting, right? Even the, it's hard, the AP, and there's or, also a lot of loose talk. You know, I, I, I grabbed two words that were interesting to me because it was the Boston Globe led a campaign against Donald Trump's campaign against journalists, which is scurrilous and, and, and wrong. Um, and, and and is debasing to our institutions. And I don't think you'll get a lot of disagreement. So what is it when the Boston Globe calls that a dirty war? What's a dirty war? Remember what the dirty war was? Remember how many people died? Remember in stadiums and disappearances? Is that the right analogy for the members of the press to use to describe Donald Trump's actions? Or is that kind of invidious? Sure, but that is a that is a editorial page versus a news news and there is a difference right mm -hmm. I don't actually I see more balance on your opinion page than I do in your news section wow. but that's just me <laughs> I, I mean I, I um, John looks pained yeah he wants I, to I, clearly I, I, jump in <clears throat> um, I, I, I think that's unfair to the New York Times um, uh, I think that we um, could take it I'm sure you can <laughs> Um, I think that, um, you know, democracy is a complicated dance. We all have different roles to play. But the idea um, that uh, we are doomed uh, to sort of be a tower of Babel because we're all going to default to our emotional truths and there is no such thing or very few such things as uh, facts seems to me to be a very 
a perilous path. And I think part of the problem, frankly, is that we have sort of defaulted too often to emotional truths in our conversation, our civic conversations. Um, so anyone can come to the debate uh, with their emotional truth, uh, and, and we're all left sort of precisely nowhere as we attempt to reason together in a democracy, which is the macro point. No one's got a monopoly on the truth, but that is very different than the idea um, that they're all uh, that we're all swimming through a sea of alternative facts and truth is not truth. Um, uh, and I think we and need so to be- And CNN is the arbiter of that truth? No, I did not say that, Danielle. Oh. But, but I, I, well, I appreciate you asking. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think that there is a good faith effort to bring different perspectives to a table and to try um, to uh, root conversations uh, in a fact-based debate. You know, Tom Nichols has a book called The Death of Expertise uh, that is worthwhile. Um, Isaac Asimov famously said at one point that you know, one of the real dangers is the idea that uh, my ignorance is as good as your knowledge. Um, you know, we do need to make sure we are rooting our, our, our conversations. And you're right to point out you know, you know, statistics about the dirty war, but I'm sure that's not what the Boston Globe Intended, um, oh, it's, out, but, it's, but it's allowed to be loose with its with its well, language. No, I, I just I wouldn't be okay. too. Pre I I I, um, I think we need to be you know one of I think we need to be careful we don't um, go down a path of a deflection into something that that could uh, seem like uh, what about ism the outrage about Khashoggi um, is not, does not take away from uh, the deaths in Syria or Yemen or any place else. It's a story that is happening right now. Uh, that is unfolding in real time, um, and that because the Washington Post saw one of their columnists murdered and it was lied about and the truth has come out, uh, that's an example of the process working, however fitfully, against the official version of events. That's called holding power to account. Yeah, but but I, I think Danielle does make a good point about the... Uh, she makes the, many good points. Um, so. <laughs> all good points. About uh, the amount of coverage and... Uh, um, I think uh, Jim made a good point about uh, being careful to, not to label things lies just because they're not true. Uh, politicians, sadly, say lots of things that are not true. Sometimes they're lying. Other times they are mistaken. Other times, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe it uh, could be a lot of reasons that, uh, that, that lead them to that point. But the, um, I think that the issue of uh, how much do you cover uh, a certain issue. Uh, we mentioned the uh, exhaustive coverage of the president's boasts about his inaugural crowd, um, which is uh, perhaps a window into his character, but probably not highly relevant in terms of impact on the country, the fortunes of the United States. I, just to give you an illustration, I think we do need to think about uh, the coverage emphasis. Uh, one of our uh, rivals, a, a newspaper, maintains a, a list, maybe they all do, of, uh, of Trump's lies. And these are things he has said, which the paper says are not true. Many of them are not true. Of course, you know, you'd, you'd have to know his state of mind to, and to know intent. But, uh, but the point is that they listed among the lies the claim about the inaugural crowd and the, I think he had overestimated the number of times he had been on the cover of Time magazine. So that was, that was, that counts as two. And then they also, in, uh, out of fairness, had the lies of President Obama. Lies, they were things that were not true, whether President Obama was lying, I don't know. But, so you've got, uh, you've got two, uh, you've got the Time magazine boast and the inauguration crowd boast, that counts as two. On the Obama ledger, it was one lie when he said, uh, if you like your health plan and you like your doctor, you can keep it. This is a falsehood that affected the health care of millions of people. Now, I'm not, I'm not getting into who's the bigger liar. I am saying that it's important to have perspective, uh, both in terms of understanding that whether you label something a lie or a falsehood, but also on the, on the emphasis on the amount of coverage you give to a, a particular 
story. Can I say one, just one interesting thing? Because there, all these stories do have context, and there's, um, there's got to be certainly something to just do. Stories get overplayed, of course, all the time, and and they're also sort of algorithmic reasons. I've heard about some of that today, and th people can't get enough, and there's too much giving people what they want, but that's the business model right now, so we have to figure out how to not let that cloud our judgment. But there was the fact that it was the very first appearance that his press secretary chose to make in the briefing room was about the crowd, and you will accept this end of story. This, you know, so there was like there were extra administration presidential theatrics that drew quite a bit of coverage that may not have played but, and, and, and not 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 only that if I may look of course perspective is the most important thing and it's the thing we have least of in our political debates right um, and that's one of the things the press should be trying to bring forward but that list that I believe you're referring to the Washington Post list which I think Greg Char Sargent puts together actually is very careful about not calling all those things lies. I think the term they use is falsehoods. I, I don't think it was the Sargent list, but it's the, um, maybe Kessler. Oh, they, sorry, Glenn anyway. Kessler. Yes, um, I apologize. Um, but but they're actually very conscious of not calling everything a lie. I know in, in your newsroom there was a big debate about that, and the the bar is intent, and I think that's a fair bar for using the phrase lie. Yeah, but but for what it's worth. Um, you know, th there is an attempt to distinguish, however imperfectly, between falsehoods, fabrications, and, and lies for, for just that reason of perspective, which wasn't dealt with the relative weight of these things, um, but, but it's, not, it's something that they are, they're quite mindful of and, and try to be. I'm, I have to confess to you I'm much less concerned about calling Donald Trump out on the childish lies that he tells, um, where I think, you know, again, it's not that, it, again, I said it's self-evident. I'm not uncomfortable with calling a lie a lie. Um, uh, by any standard, I'm not even that uncomfortable with keeping track of Donald Trump's many, many, many lies. Uh, I find much more disturbing the the subtle questions that I tried to allude to in the in the uh, question of of Khashoggi, um, where again, in my dream world. That's on the front page every day. Those are the issues I care about. Those are the people I care about. That's what I've worked for my entire life. That's what I care about, okay? You know, um, when people went after the Washington Post for defending him because he was an Islamist, believe me, I pointed out very clearly, okay? He, he might have been an Islamist, but he wasn't calling for violence against anybody. All he was doing was writing. And that's not a crime that should earn you death in your consulate when you're going to pick up a piece of paper, let alone any sort of mistreatment. The problem is the, problem is the choices that are made. And they're very subtle. And they're, I think, not very clearly understood. You know, I care a great deal about Syria, too. I wish to hell that we have not let half a million people die there. I wish to hell that Barack Obama had not felt that it was his moment of liberation to quote Jeff Goldberg from The Atlantic, when he didn't have to pursue his red line and do something about chemical attacks that killed men, women, and children. I'd like that to get as much coverage, okay? It, do not, you cannot pretend to me. This is on the merits. But can I say one because thing? Because it's about Trump and Jared Kushner. And again, ask all the questions, point it all out, Say what's unsavory. I'm always going to agree with you on this. The point is, it has gotten saturation coverage beyond any relationship with reality. Uh, can I make two slightly separate points on that? Um, first, starting with uh, Syria and yes. and Russia, or Syria, the Syrian chemical weapons use, and that would be, you know, I was in Moscow right when the it was the first chemical weapons attack that we struck. We sent the tomahawks in. It was like mm -hmm. a Trump year and a half ago. Yeah. Spring. April, April of 2017. 2017. And, and I was in Moscow and, you, and watching the news there, uh, the, the, the Western journalists and uh, the administration through, based on reporting from the administration, were saying, this is a chemical weapons attack. And the Russian press and, and state media was saying, but their own president says that the, all this press is fake news, so why should you believe it? So I do think little symb symbolic things do end up mattering in terms of uh, the way news is consumed globally. On, can I ask you one? On how do you pronounce Kashog? Is it Kashogi? Kashogi. Okay. I know. I have the same. I mean, I've written his name. Uh, but anyway, um, I think there the, the question is: um, 
did, first of all, that it raises a lot of different questions that, that need to be asked of even ourselves, right? Did Western media, and I columnized on this last week, buy into this once again, the idea of the liberalizing Middle Eastern <clears throat> reformer, you know, and, and everyone in Hollywood was there lining up, right? So I think there's some bipartisan blame to go around, at least to be skeptical. Um, and you do hope that the message from an administration is that, you know, journalists shouldn't be killed and, and, and full, was, full throated. I don't know, but how much was it? Was it? I think actually it really was. I think Donald Trump said one stupid thing and eight smart. So things you're saying about the, it. so the ro so basically and so you're saying that him saying it could be rogue killers ends up overshadowing the other, which is well, a fair. Well, and point, I mean, but, and you know, it, it's not like that's not where we all knew it was going to end up in the first place because well, that's what happens. But anyway, that's a digression for you. Yes. What you want but, to talk about? But but to Daniel, to to your macro point about you know wishing there was more coverage about Syria and and uh, uh, other things. I mean. <clears throat> there, there's a, Jim alluded to this, um, but, you know, there is a, a degree of responsibility um, among news consumers, too, right? Because, you know, you, you, you vote every two to four years, but you vote with your eyeballs and your wallets every day. And um, uh, foreign news coverage is expensive. It's vitally important. But people sometimes start to tune these things out. It's our job as journalists to make important stories interesting. Um, and, and I think it's no excuse uh, if something's important, but it seems too hard to make interesting. Well, that's our job, make it interesting. Um, but I also think that you know people need to understand that what you click on, you will get more of in this particular time. People? And, no, all, all of us. So, so just, you know. <laughs> The, the more you, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you click solely on celebrity scandals and car crashes and cat videos, you're going to get more celebrity scandals, car crashes, and cat videos. Um, you know, th that has to do with the, the larger changes in how we can measure what people want. And then there's a temptation to give people what they want. And um, that can lead to uh, um, a, a form of media that's bread and circuses as opposed to the hard news that I think Danielle's saying, she wishes she had more of. I'm still not entirely sure about what Obama's red line has to do with Trump coverage, um, but um, we could we could go dollars to donuts on. on, on I'm sure we can go dollars to covered. donuts on tons of stuff, but but I, I think that's that's an important uh, point for us all to keep oh, in mind too. Way. Is that we can measure more precisely now what people read than we could in a pure newspaper era. That's not to say it's all on you. It's ultimately about the editorial decisions and resources and, and the news organizations that have that global uh, uh, ability to report or ones that bootstrap it and choose to make those priorities. Um, but it, it's a combination of editorial choices, the obligation to make the important stories interesting, and, and people needing to understand that what you click on, you will get more of. Thanks. Um, you know, we're pretty quickly running out of time. So I had some questions, but they covered most of the things I wanted to address. Um, uh, the one sort of point I'll leave, and if, uh, I'll, I'll leave with before we open for some questions, and maybe people can think about it if somebody wants to jump in, is what is the effect of all this stuff? You know, if we pull the lens back from a lot of the conversation we had, uh, we're living in an era, you know, that sort of shifted the nature of journalism, and we see, and back to the technology issue, it's not just the president using Twitter and blasting out his every thought you know, in, into, into the mass media. But journalists themselves, you know, they're writing stories one day, then tweeting the next day and seeing something on the news and putting their opinion out there. And this is a new role for journalists. And I'm not talking about the media columnists and, and a political advisor and editorial board, but there's regular journalists out there constantly talking about this stuff, and then they have to retract the Twitter feed um, and try to make believe it went away, but it doesn't. You know, mm -hmm. there's a famous scene from um, Broadcast News, which probably <laughs> only half of the people in this room ever heard of, <laughs> but you should, it should have been required viewing before this panel. And there's a famous scene there uh, where William Hurt is being groomed to be the next big anchor replacing Jack Nichol Nicholson. Um, and they put him into this live crisis, you know, breaking news. And he's doing this story about some Libyan jets. And American jets are scrambling into the Mediterranean. They might be attacking American base in Italy. Um, and he's doing it all live. And, he's, and they're sort of thrilled with the way it's all going. But it's kind of, he's lost his ear feed for a second. And they say, ad lib, ad lib at the end. And he goes, well, the latest news coming in is that the Libyan jets have returned to Tripoli, which means I think we're all going to be okay. And the two executive producers who were thrilled with this performance, you know, laughing, you know, and they're joking how great he is. And then he says, I think we're all going to be okay. One of them just puts a face like this. He goes, 
Who the hell cares what you think? <laughs> and that's what journalism used to be. Right. And now we have people like Marvin Kalb. He just wrote a, a, a big book that I, I recommend. I mean, as you see, we have very diverse viewpoints here. I think you should get, you should, you know, you should attack all this stuff and think about it yourself. Uh, Marvin, Marvin Kalb, long time, decades uh, as a journalist with CBS News, NBC News, uh, one time host of, of Meet the Press. I think he was hired by Edward R. Morrow. Uh, by the way, um, Jim and, and John, I was going to mention uh, two very important articles that they wrote. Uh, Jim wrote a, a very important article in August uh, in the New York Times titled, Trump is Testing the Norms of Objectivity in Journalism. Very, break, very groundbreaking article that's worth reading. John Avalon did a very important piece when he was editor-in-chief of the Daily Beast called Our Morrow Moment. And it was all about how do we manage journalism and, and press objectivity in this age. But as Dan, Danny said before, journalists are humans. And then we want to know how much does this bleed in. And I think for me, and I like to see both sides on this, but I do see a lot of journalists openly saying this is an unparalleled Hitler-like threat to the republic that must be stopped. And Edward R. Morrow, and people have a right to think <laughs> that, by the way. John, why are you making that face? Ed, Edward you R. Morrow, you want a source on that? saying it's a Hitler-like <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, we hear the we coming, a agent, source the on coming that? of I do have a source on that, and uh, here it is. It. Marvin Kalb said in, in Meet the Press, uh, this is on September 18th, and he's talking about his book, uh, Enemy of the People, Trump's War in the Press, the New McCarthyism, and the Threat to American Democracy. But is he represented? He's, how, he's retired. For no, but here's what, he, here's, here's what he said. Here's what he said. He said, quote, there's a point at which the heart and soul of the press in a free society comes into play. And I think that there are many illustrations right now of the press taking a role in fighting back. For 60 years as a reporter, I was quite happy to cover the news and go home and not intrude my opinion into, into it at all. But I've changed my mind now. And I think that because Trump is essentially taking steps that undermine our democracy, thinking about this has to be changed, unquote. Meaning the journalist has to play the role of protecting the democracy. And I have no problem with that stuff. And again, I have no problem with people going to extremes and seeing Trump in an extreme way. People could have different viewpoints on this. But the question is, and the question is for, for journalists, if he's recommending that journalists see Trump as, a, as an ultimate threat to democracy and that they have to view their role in a different way, then how can you trust their reporting? I mean, are they going to report good news about the White House? If there's good, or is, do they see that as just building up Trump and potentially getting him reelected? So if they see him as a dire threat to the democracy, then and Trump calls them fake news, which I happen to think is an extreme statement. And, I don't, and like everyone else here, I think Trump uh, you know, lies and exaggerates and, he, and, he's, and he's reckless in a lot of things that he does. But when you hear journalists saying that it's their job now to play a different role in journalism, and this, was, this book is widely celebrated. I'm not saying everyone agrees he, with it. but He did gets, retire in 1987. Yeah, no, I'll take his career, believe I, me. I, I understand. But this is a guy who was hired by Edward R. Morrow. Uh, who's now saying that and recommending that this is a unique threat to democracy. And when you hear things like that, and by the way, Chuck Todd's reaction was, well, if you're standing up for the democracy, is that really bias? That was Chuck Todd's response to that statement. And then he, you know, he brought more panelists in and people discussed this stuff. But this is something that I think people, you know, people have to think about because if you say you can't trust journalists, if journalists say their job is to now pr protect the American democracy from this unique threat, uh, and I think journalism is doing a great job, by the way. So I'm not critiquing the journalism. Jim and I were talking before um, about, I think, the great job the journalism is doing. But they give an opening to Trump to react and to call it fake news and to have people believe that. And I think it's, it's detrimental and destructive if you want to actually hold him accountable. There's plenty to hold him accountable on for his policies, for some of the words that he says, and go out and win an election based on those things. But I think when you engage in that sort of hyperbole, if it bleeds into the press coverage or the perception of some journalists, that's where it plays right into Trump's hands. And people will be surprised if they're trying to stop Trump, you might end up seeing him win another election in 2020 when you sort of react in, in that way. Want to jump in on that? I don't, well, how much time do we have? Yeah, we, we have time. John, do you want to? I don't want to. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. And then we'll I, open the questions. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take his essay yeah. when he's been <laughs> retired for that long as, as, as a um, necessarily a, as, you know, on the pulse of the current conversations in newsrooms. Um, <clears throat> that sounds to me like somebody weighing in from retirement on what they see with a sense of, of perspective. Um, but well, I, I, well, Wait a minute. But, but, you're saying that the current media folk 
don't refer to Trump as authoritarian or, or raise these questions? I mean, the coming of fascism, you see, you need read the New Yorker Review of Books. I mean, read, read the New Yorker, and I love these magazines. I've been getting them for decades. But there's article after article about how this is like the time of Hitler. And, and the coming of fascism. I'll, I'll send you the article. Well, well, but, but, but they just, write I, about it, John. I, I, I mean, it's a fact. I, I would, it's, it's I would distinguish the, between opinion, analysis, and reporting. I think that's really important. Um, and, and uh, you know, certainly there, there was a, I mean, God, I wrote a book called Wingnuts in 2010 about the. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> about the, uh, well, it, it, was, it was really about, about you personally. reporting in the first year of the Obama administration about the feedback loop between the extremes and about the historical antecedents for these things. Um, so, uh, and, and I think that's a perfectly worthwhile exercise. I think history can be useful, but, you know, I, I was looking at the, the uh, Donald Trump on a particular Tuesday uh, gave a speech at Kansas, I believe it's Kansas City um, uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars and did, gave a, a, a line about, I don't believe what you see, don't believe what you read. The same day he called one of his opponents, or accused him of a new McCarthyism. Um, and so I went back and looked, read a book called McCarthy in the Press. Uh, and it was interesting because reporters had a debate at the time about how to cover McCarthy. Um, they had been trained to just report what he says. But if he's saying things that they know and McCarthy knows not to be true, what's the obligation? Um, it gets the stenographer in power question. Um, and there was one editor at the Denver Post at the time who said, no, we, we, we can address that in a headline. We can address that. Um, and I, but I think there's a crucial difference between analysis, opinion, and reporting. Right, well, I, I, I differentiate. I differentiate the people on the panel and journalists that now tweet things out and sometimes have to pull it back. Because, well, that's the, yeah, and that's, that's an issue. Right. No, I mean, but that's, this is their issue. opinion. And, they have, yeah, and yeah, again, they're awful. human. They're human. They, they have a right to have those opinions. Yes, but I'm just, it's it doesn't crazy. play well in terms of the, the ability of yeah. Trump and his supporters and people to, to call into question the journalism let, of the day. Let, let me actually, there's an interesting, uh, well, we, sorry, just, sorry, James, yeah, go ahead. Jim, no, no, Jim no. then we gotta open it up. Uh, yeah, 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 no, I know you want to get to that, Well, we will. We're, we're totally we're live. No, no, 8.15, we ended 8.15. I'm we're, going until midnight, let's go. Okay, we're still, we're gonna keep, Dan, see, Danny has to Where's catch the a train. <laughs> okay, Danny has to catch a train, that's what, that's the problem right now. But, I wanna uh, hear from the okay. people. Yeah, please, yeah, let's, uh, let's, sure. uh, yeah, okay. let's open it up. Is there, is there something set? Uh, there's a microphone over there, over there. Todd. It, you can go first. You can place yourself over there. Whoever has questions, we hate you have to actually stand up, but wander over there. Tell us who you are, uh, even though we know who he is. I'm Todd Gitlin. I'm a professor of journalism and sociology, and I have a concern about John's statement early on that the news media have been plummeting, or words to that effect, in trust, trustability. It's not true. I looked up the numbers the other day, because I was going to speak on this. If we just limit ourselves to Gallup polls, which ask the same question year after year, right? do you trust the news media? Words to that effect. Um, they don't specify which media, they just ask it. So here's what it looks like. Um, it was very trusted, whatever that means, that's another question, in the 70s, Watergate period, post-Vietnam War, and then it plunges, and then it comes back, and then it plunges again, and then it comes back, and it's on its way back, like in, 19, in 2007, it's almost as high in trust as it was in the 70s. And then it falls off the cliff in 2007, 2008, long before Trump. Mm -hmm. And the point is that the, what people are saying, first of all, it's not clear. Are they saying they don't trust the media because it's too noisy or it's too smart or it's too stupid or it's too left wing or right wing? This is all amalgamated. But the important thing is that I think the reason it collapsed in 2008 is that trust in American institutions generally collapsed in 2008 for reasons we all understand, okay, financial crisis. And therefore, to say now, to imply that people are losing trust in the media because they're nasty about Trump or something is just flatly wrong. There's no evidence of that. 
So I, um, I don't believe I actually, let me, let me clarify what I believe I said or let me try to say it a little more clearly. Um, first of all, I said I think pretty clearly that Donald Trump is a symptom, not a cause of a lot of the things we're facing right now. Uh, two, um, while Gallup polls are very good gauge because they do ask the same question over a period of time, um, I was actually recalling uh, polls in the mid, I hate this term, aughts, the first decade. Uh, um, no, what do I call it? I, I, it's <laughs> the uh-ohs is what we should have called it. Um, but, um, uh, but that actually did break out by source uh, and how trusted they were. Um, uh, and it had been a period of decline. This is all against a broader backdrop of decline of trust in institutions. I think Stephen Carter wrote a book about this in the late 1990s. Um, and while there will be ebbs and flows, and I think this is a great time to be a journalist, by the way. Um, I think, um, except if you want to make money. Uh, pardon? I said, except if you want to make money. <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've run a news organization. I can talk to you about that, too. But, um, but, uh, but I do think that it is, the reason it's so, uh, what we're dealing with right now is so troubling is because there is a long-term decline in trust in institutions for a lot of reasons. And when those, that decline in trust is exacerbated, um, by uh, the rhetoric of the person who's sort of got the bully pulpit, that's doubly troubling um, because democracy does depend on trust in civic institutions. That is, has been eroded through a variety of forms. And again, it w far precedes Trump. Um, but uh, he has not taken upon himself to try to restore that trust in institutions. Uh, that, uh, you know, because I think he's, he is a disruptor. Um, that is the positive way to look at what he has done. So he has not uh, been as focused on, on that. But I, I would actually, I mean, I think this is a really important topic and one that, uh, you know, and one that, that, that would take a lot longer than we have this evening. But I mean, I think, you know, in the sense that you said Trump is a symptom and, and, and it, this is something that absolutely predated him. Um, no, Trump, Trump is, is, yes, he's a disruptor, but he's also got a feral sense for the sort of pulse of, uh, mm -hmm. of the country. He is a marketing, I never thought I'd use the word this way about him, but you know, he is a, he is a marketing genius. I have called him that too, All right. I agree. Uh, so he really is, and so I actually, yes, I think we would like our presidents to be the people who would be about the restoration of trust. But I do think that this is a more important issue. Uh, and you brought up you brought up the the book, The Death of Expertise. This came up very much in the context of, of, of the Brexit debate and a lot of the the debates that have gone on uh, in in Europe and in the United States about populism. Um, and you know, again, I come from a different different walk of life. We are the experts that everybody hates. Um, and, and and the right thing at that moment. Um, when you understand that there's a loss of faith in, faith in institutions, and by the way, it's not just the press, it's not just the institutions of government, it's not just the financial institutions that we believed were oxalate, it's also the church, um, mm -hmm. it, you know, not helping, by the way, uh, and the universities, right? And, and the problem I is that for too many of us, and I, I know we try to resist doing this, but we do it as well, is that the answer is, well, you just don't understand how awesome it is that we are because you're stupid. Um, right, universities are fabulous. They don't merit this loss of faith. You know, we're not biased. We're Harvard. Um, got Columbia out of it. And, you know, for, 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 for myself as a manager of people who, who, who deal with national security policy, and for me, who was and remains very, uh, believe that we did the right thing in fighting the Iraq war, um, still believe that we did the right thing. You have to turn around and say to yourself, what did we do wrong? What have we done wrong? Where did we go wrong and where does this loss of faith come from? Because it's not just that people don't understand how super we are. Um, you know, th it, it isn't. And this, this, the problem for that is that while I, I've certainly tried and we've tried to engage in this, I don't think that that happens across the board. I think there's a whole democracy dies in darkness rise of self-righteous self-love that has risen up in the wake of this loss of faith in institutions that is not helping at all and that, as somebody here said, is going to get Donald Trump reelected in 2020. But there is also a part of what we do, especially on the news side, which is um, to be the messenger. And people want to shoot the messenger. I mean, sometimes you could talk to 
there are a lot of Hillary Clinton voters who are very mad at the New York Times, and I oh, can yeah. say that you to a con that conservative <laughs> <laughs> audience. Don't go. You could say that to a conservative audience, and they sometimes and they'd be shocked. So uh, sometimes the job that we do is to make people unhappy, and mm -hmm. the job is not to be uh, to do a counter. How do we make people like us? Like it's you know I think. My, uh, today, uh, my, the publisher spoke at CNN, and I went there not mm -hmm. to show the boss that I was listening to him and to <laughs> get some brownie points. Perhaps, well, maybe that was part of it. But anyway, he said that he, you know, maybe you would disagree with this approach, but he's saying that's why we want to open up our newsroom more, let people see us. I think they have thought differently about some hiring decisions yeah. after the fall um, of 16. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, but we can talk about that afterwards. I want to apologize because I have a train to catch. It's the last bloody train protest. It shouldn't be at 9 o'clock. Thank you all so much. Really, don't, don't. We're not leaving this day. You're One quarter of us is leaving. And, and, and really, yeah, I've left you in, in New York in is more fun. Hands. New York is more fun. Yeah, well. Miss the train. Yeah. You can miss the train. Uber home. <laughs> you have to pay for that. No, Ingrid has to pay for that. I don't have to pay for anything. Um, any more questions? Now the microphone can come to you. Matthew has the microphone. Helen has a question. Hi. Um, my name's Helen. I'm from NYU, so came all the way from downtown. Um, I'm I have almost a an alum. I didn't yes. graduate, but anyway. <laughs> like Way Bill to represent. Gates. Um, uh, I have like a two-prong question. The first part is there's a this is not my first like panel, uh, like attending a panel discussing media in the age of Trump, and we've always discussed the imperative of media's role in this whole dialogue and conversation. But what does that plan look like? Other than talking about the importance, what can media actually do? What's the, what are the things that they can, the steps they can take to address this, rather than just kind of talking to people who I'm sure all of us in this room are intellectuals and understand the imperative, and which is why we're here. And the second point of my question is, how do we deal with self-proclaimed journalists? So in the age of like technology and the internet, a lot of people can go online, write blogs, and say that their opinion is the right one and make up facts like we talked about before. So how do we deal with those self-proclaimed journalists versus the quote unquote legitimate ones that we see on cable news, for right. example? Uh, that's enough of a complicated and good question. L let me say one quick thing, we'll open it up, because that's the reason I was bringing up the, the call point before, because I was juxtaposing this idea that journalists are in the vanguard defending us from authoritarianism. And the point I wanted to make, I, I didn't quite get to it, was that in John's piece and in Jim's piece, and, and James, you could, you've written a, a lot about this stuff on your side. They were, not, they were nowhere near where Cobb was. I mean, I, that was the point you guys were raising. They actually brought up points that I believe were kind of a, were a template for journalism in the age of Trump, which is basically, if he's not acting normal about certain things, call him out for not being normal about certain things, but have it be fact-based and be a, an objective watchdog in the, in the model of an Edward R. Morrow. And that's the beginning of the solution to the journalism problem where you can actually have honest journalism and not help Trump get reelected. And I believe the two of you wrote very similar pieces um, that I thought was the right way for journalists to behave. But like I said, this is an age where everyone gets a little bit hysterical sometimes, and it's hard to always keep well, that under wraps. So, so James said something that, um, you know, it's important that uh, you know you give credit where credit is due. So I do a segment every day on a new day uh, called Reality Check, and uh, two weeks ago I did uh, Trump's best week ever because in one week he had confirmed Kavanaugh, gotten a NAFTA renegotiation through, uh, and had unemployment fall through to a nearly 50-year low. That's a really good week for any president. Um, and there were you know we're journalists we get lots of feedback on social media, praise, blame, threats, is a, you know, some, some mix of all three is, is a usual cocktail. Um, but, but it is important that we give credit where credit's due in order so that we can hold to account with credibility. Right, exactly. Uh, and, and, and that is an obligation that I think all journalists in newsrooms should feel, unless their project is explicitly partisan or ideological. And, and there's a place for those folks, but I do think that's that's sort of how, you know, th that's how we've gotten to the place we are. Uh, yeah, I like uh, lots of people online sharing their views. I think that's a healthy society. Uh, some of it's going to be real. Some of it's going to be fake. Uh, it's been true for as long as our republic has existed. 
Um, so I, I think uh, uh, that's very positive. Just the, the not just the wealth of of media outlets, but the uh, amazing ability for anyone to be a publisher and to and to become a journalist. I don't uh, I don't think you have to be formally trained to do it well. So I think uh, those are all uh, very very positive things. Uh, as far as how we cover Trump, I think it, it you really uh, people can go down a very wrong path saying it's time to throw out the ro uh, rules of journalism because this guy is so awful. I think you can cover him with the same standards you cover everyone else. And if he does things that are worse than other people, you can say that and point that out. Uh, but um, but yeah, I, I think uh, deciding uh, absent facts that, that he is a unique threat who must be stopped, it sounds like that's maybe a, someone who ought to be in in political activism versus versus journalism, I would say. Um, and uh, just, uh, I guess, thinking about how we cover him generally, I mean, I think the big underreported story of the Trump era is the uh, fidelity with which he has pursued the agenda he campaigned on in 2016. I don't like some of it, I I like the uh, tax cutting and the regulation cutting. I don't really like the trade and immigration agenda, but it's striking for a politician how he methodically pursues that agenda he told us about in 2016. And, and I think it's a lot, we get all of these stories about how chaotic and crazy this White House is and ever, someone's about to be fired. And, and I'm not saying any of them are false stories. I'm not branding them fake news, but I think it is not really been explored much how amid this seeming chaos we read about, he seems to be able to remain focused on that agenda that he promised. You know, and that and that's showing up in the and it's, I've tried to bring up politics for it's showing up in the electorate. And I know the Wall Street, the Wall Street Journal editorial pages on free trade, but he had, and I'm, I generally lean in your direction, but he has done things that have created different kinds of trade opportunities. The new NAFTA is an underreported story. Yeah. I mean, that was, uh, many people, including myself, thought that was not, that was pretty impossible, especially right. some of his rhetoric. And by the way, he's now at a 17 point advantage over the Democrats on the question of trade. And that's usually a very difficult polling question. And it might not be the deciding, factor in two weeks tomorrow, but this is part of an ethos of people believe he, he made promises and despite all the chaos that they read about in the news every day, he's actually slowly a, a tax cut, corporate tax cut, economic growth of 4%, trade, uh, yeah, jobs. Yeah, and, and I think we got to get used to the fact we're going to pay more for cars now. Yeah, no. There's I, some I, good stuff in there, but yes. We the know the editorial is, board of the it, Wall Street Journal is on the it, free trade. It is, it is definitely a win for him. Right. And it's, a, it's one of the signature promises, and, exactly. and, and he delivered like it, and we are showing up in the electorate. Yeah, it's showing up in the electorate. So uh, can, I, can I just take that, that part of that question? Because yeah. um, I would agree with James that it's not journalism's job to stop anything. Uh, and I do think that column, if you read to the bottom of that column, what it says is, that it actually is the basics, and the basics are calling it the way it is, unvarnished exactly how it is. And what I was talking about in that column, and some people were yeah. talking about this during the campaign, and they were using a term that I just personally did not like. It was false balance. It just became like one of those phrases that to me didn't mean yeah, things to people. Okay. Um, but the idea was like, okay, and, and by the way, when you described it, the column is saying you need to call him out for not being normal. It's not calling him out. It's, it's reporting on Report it, normal, explore yeah. it. It's right. different, right. right? That's the nature of news. And there was a thing that set in in journalism that became called by others false balance. And it was they both lied, right? But if someone lied 10 times and the other person lied one time, it's, it's different. And that's, that was uncomfortable at that time, right? And so there was a little bit of that seeping into the coverage, right? Um, when Trump went to a rally and said, hey, that guy, yeah, beat him up. You know, there was that moment in the rally. That was different. And that's not something that you're used to seeing and covering as a journalist. And there's no, what's the other side of that? Like, the guy had it coming, you know? Like, I don't think that's it. So there were these things that journalism was struggling with. But I'll say that I think the imperative of journalism is, and, and what I think it is, isn't what everyone thinks it is. And that's the great thing about our industry, is everyone has different things that they really care about. I, in my coverage of politics over the years, what really bothers me is when people make big voting decisions based on something that's not true. It bothers me. 
it's our, now I'm, I can't, I don't care what the voting decision is, but my job is to, maybe it's because I was a philosophy major and I read my Kant, but um, <laughs> it is, I have to go Google it again and make sure I'm making that reference. But anyway, that, that it's, you don't, that I like seeing, win on the merits. Can't you win without saying something false? If your argument's good, you should be able to win that way. And so a lot of what I did when I started covering politics was something called ad boxes where you watched the politicians' ads, because that was the main way falsehoods mm -hmm, got out mm -hmm. back then, and you just true squatted it. And to me, that was like the highest calling, even though no one, ever, no, it was like doing windows in our business. No one, everyone, no, everyone tried to pass the buck, and I liked doing those. Mm -hmm. So I really care about just calling it as it is, as well as you can, and you're gonna make mistakes, and you're gonna get stories wrong, and yes, if you live in New York City, you're gonna kind of have some certain geographical grounding, not everybody. Um, it might sway you, but at the end of the day, your facts have to be right, and both sides are going to say that you're unfair, and it's, there's a, a lot of gaming of the refs going on here. So for mm -hmm. all the valid points, there's also people trying to game us. So you know, you're trying to take in all this noise to cut through it to get at the truth, and that is what um, I think journalism is about. Now, if do you call her Danny? Yeah. Uh, if Danny were here, she'd say, well, that's so lofty and what, okay, maybe it is. And not every journalist feels this way and whatever, but. but you know. Know, Marty Barron, the editor of the Washington Post has a way of saying it too, that I think clarifies. And yes, it's under the banner of democracy dies in darkness, but we don't go to war, we go to work. Um, and that's, I think, gotten a lot of attention. It's a catchy, memorable phrase, these things matter, but I think it does uh, capture the way most journalists think about what we do every day. Okay, I see the microphone is out there. Please. Hi, uh, my name's Sultan. Um, I'm a student at Teachers College across the street. Um, John, you mentioned how sort of what we click on, we get more of. Mm -hmm. So how, so however there's, you know, rooms full of people who for eight, eight hours a day, every day, they'll just comment or reshare the same sort of message and article or um, computer programs and bots that'll do the same thing uh, reshare articles or comment the same type of agenda. How should we confront that, deal with that, or can we even deal with that? Well, I think you, you, um, you're asking, or at least I, I, I can see two different elements to that question, right? Um, <clears throat> confirmation bias clickbait is a real problem in news, and it builds out of the fragmentation and the business model of cocooning and playing to, to the base. Um, um, you know, comments for, on articles, for example, uh, many sites um, got rid of them because they had really stopped shedding any light and they were all heat and they were all angry and they kind of degraded the discourse and they were disproportionately dominated by trolls. Um, um, and so there was, you know, you, you, you evolved. I think one of the fascinating and troubling things about the times in which we live is some of the articles that are amplified um, and some of the rhetoric that's amplified on social media in particular, um, you know, may be done by bots um, or, or foreign actors, as well as deeply committed people who spend all their time. So I think we all need to think uh, a little bit bigger about the challenges we face. It's not that there's anything new under the sun, but the technology is new. And um, so these are new challenges for us to, to confront. Um, and. Um, and, and that's a, 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 a troubling thing that affects our perceptions. Uh, it amplifies uh, the loudest, and it, it maybe makes us feel more divided than we actually are. Um, but but you know, that's a version of gaming the system based on the fact that we have a new, new thing, social media. Uh, and it can be exploited by foreign actors as well as hardcore partisans, um, as well as trolls, as well as good people trying to express their views sincerely. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Or any more questions out there? Microphones, yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Henry Nass. I live in the area. Uh, and although this may seem superficial, you know, how, how can people look at the idea that, that Trump is a kind of reckless person or impulsive or maybe is quoting the, the last thing he heard on television or should I not believe those things are really the way it's reported by people who work inside the White House? Well, this is what I think is, is one of the questions of this era, is, is how is it 
if he's if it's such a mess in the White House that he has been uh, so effective in sticking to the agenda he campaigned on and enacting it. Now, not not everything, obviously, but you go down the line in terms of uh, the tax cut, the deregulation, the the uh, the new uh, North American trade deal. Uh, his appointments are exemplary. I mean, what, whatever you sort of your view is, I think you'd have to acknowledge that he did not come in and and staff the government and and the cabinet with with uh, reality TV oddities, right? They're all very accomplished, credentialed people. <laughs> what? Kavanaugh's credentials but, but are Amarosa outstanding. Was, you, you might not like him, but you, you talk about the, the record, yeah. the, the uh, hundreds of opinions, which I think you can gather uh, his uh, opponents in the Senate couldn't find much fault with because they had no interest in talking about them. Well, when you talk about repairing the damage, what we what we know right now is a, there is an economic revival in the United States. Now we can't say for sure how long it will last, uh, what the ultimate impact will be, but that's uh, so far uh, the opposite of damage. Now, if you're talking about uh, uh, damage to institutions, um, that's a that's a question for people to. To answer, but I, I think as I look at it, I don't see where the, the uh, diminishing of press freedom is. I see a lot of ill-considered tweets and comments that, that are uh, hard to defend, but I don't see actions that are limiting our ability. And as I said, the, his opponents are thriving right now. I don't see any any limits on John and his colleagues to say exactly what they think about the president and, and same with Jim. So I, I guess I'd, I'd like to see some, a concrete case on how the, the institutions of the press are, are being harmed in some way. Okay, we're quickly running out of time. Just want to point out, I've been to these evening events before. There's a big crowd sticking around past eight o'clock, so we appreciate that. Let's do, um, if you could do one quick one and one quick one yeah. and one more, maybe the three in a row and see if people want to address it at, sure. in the last minute or two. So please, one, two, and then the microphone to the far right. Not the far right politically, but the far <laughs> right in the room. Maybe, we don't know. Hello, uh, Griffin Jones, student here at the uh, university. Um, regarding that last point, we have seen um, people who have been, we've seen the shooting at the, um, the Capitol Gazette, for example, and um, just people who've, who ended the, uh, the stopping of an attempted attack uh, with the, um, the individual was quoting the enemy of the people uh, rhetoric. Um, how does that sort of, um, does that create a chilling effect on the press? And um, how can that be taken into consideration? If you don't pass the microphone, that, oh, is it Matthew? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so is, is Trump inciting some sort of violence against journalists is, is, is the question there. And how can... uh, well, yeah, okay. Talk or you yeah. wanted to get the mic? Okay, we'll do a quick, quick response. We're the, in the lightning uh, round, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I don't have my phone. I, the Capitol Gazette shooting, I, that was not, I don't yeah, think that was, that was that a was Trump. A, that was a personal... I think it was a yeah. personal you guys issue. Yes. You guys that in the morning. And, that's right. And yeah. you know, this is one area I don't want to. But it got it, a lot of media was basically saying, "Yeah, you know, this, is, this is you know might be related, or it just shows the dangers of using that kind of language." Yeah, I, d I don't want to call it fake news because again, I don't know the intent. We we can call it mistakes, but there has been quite a uh, bit of uh, reporting when various uh, events happen. Um, uh, Sarah Palin uh, obviously sued uh, Jim's paper. Now, she did not win because uh, obviously as we enjoy the, it's a very high standard to win um, that kind of a case when you're a uh, well-known 
public official in the in the arena. But uh, but I know over the years, and this just popped up the other day, and I can't remember the journalist who was recycling this. There has been a lot of reporting suggesting that the Gabriel Giffords shooter was a conservative. It, it is completely bogus that this this story that uh, this um, deranged individual who had all kinds of political views, right, left, and center, uh, was motivated by something that uh, Sarah Palin's PAC had put out. It, there was no connection, no evidence that that he had ever uh, seen this document, which in any case, I don't think most people would say would incite a shooting. But um, So I, I think that's an area people have to be very careful after these events to as, uh, as they seek to uh, assign blame to one uh, political group or another. Very, very short question, and this is to James, because you said something that just surprised me so much. I wanted to hear more about it. When you said these appointments um, were exemplary, yeah. um, like how do you factor in um, kind of the levels of corruption, the, the misuse of fund, government funds for personal use, um, people Which in is, government like departments? Where they here. really had no ex no prior experience in those in those areas. I, like I'm interested in that. Okay, let's ask our final question. Then we will we'll respond to. Then this is okay. our final okay. bullet point. We're in the lightning round. <laughs> we appreciate you staying though. But. Yeah, thank you. So I'm a business school alum, and I work in finance. So maybe slightly different sort of approach to things. Uh, my question is really more for James um, about editorializing in the age of Trump. And um, specifically, you know, I'm from Milwaukee, so I think about Charlie Sykes. And for those never Trumpers uh, at, one, at one time, you know, what of them? And, uh, you know, on a week where I believe Ted Cruz was hearing positive things said about him by Donald Trump, you know, for you uh, or for the, uh, you know, editorial page, how do you think about those points of view? How do you incorporate different points of view into your editorials, you know, on a daily basis? and just if you could touch on that a little more broadly. OK. Um, I, I guess uh, just a, a quick answer on that, I would say if you look at the, the range of appointments, uh, the cabinet, the judicial picks, and, and I would say Justice Kavanaugh, absolutely. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the level of, uh, of qualification is, is very high and what you would expect in what we might call a normal presidency. Um, but the. Uh, um, as far as uh, the Never Trump movement, so this, I, get, I think this is something where uh, people might get a, a misperception from press coverage, is that um, I think they might uh, think that this was a, a big uh, uh, factor in 2016 and, um, and lately now maybe less so, um, but it, the, the Never Trump uh, movement was never significant among Republican voters generally. It was more of a, a phenomenon of of uh, people in journalism and think tanks um, who observe and comment on the process. And and I think you can you look at that in terms of the the share of the Republican vote that Trump got in 2016 versus the share of the Democratic vote that Hillary Clinton received. And both won overwhelmingly within their parties. Uh, Trump uh, lost uh, a small percentage to the Libertarian vote, and I, I think a couple of people in that um, cluster. And then um, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton lost some to, to uh, the uh, Green Party, et cetera. So um, I'm not sure that was ever a big, I think that was maybe kind of overdone in terms of its its uh, impact on Republican voters as opposed to the media conversation. Um, but in terms of how you treat it editorially, I mean, I think um, the uh, uh, if the the heart of that was an idea that it was that he was a, a unique authoritarian threat to the country, I think, as we said, this maybe has uh, it's a much harder case to make than it used to be. I think after two years, we can kind of say that that's uh, maybe time to retire that uh, idea in the absence of new facts. And, and this is kind of news to me that, that 
but that idea has been retired. It's very refreshing to hear it. Why didn't, so let's, know, we're going to wrap that. it up with uh, John and Jim. Uh, I think we were saying points, the please. Hitler. That was the Hitler point we thought was a little bit extreme. Right. But um, the I just wanted to say about the, the th back to the first question about threats. Um, I don't think that's good. I don't think that's good, you know, and because no one's been shot yet or maybe, you know, it's I don't like those odds. Right. And there again, I said this before, but there are police barricades in front of our building for that showed up last week for a reason I don't quite know yet. So that's that's bad. And um, I wish he wouldn't do it. And our publisher told him the same thing. Um, so I don't love testing that. And we've also seen around the world where others have picked up on that rhetoric of enemy of the people. We're not the enemy of the people. And um, it's just so there's that in terms of press freedom, uh, we did used to editorialize against Obama, because Obama did more leak investigations than any president. Um, there's a theory that, uh, I think it's who's, it was like someone's law. There's a journalistic term for it. Maybe it was Schieffer's law, Bob Schieffer, who said every administration gets consecutively more uh, restrictive on press. So we'll see if Trump and Sessions make good on threats like leak investigations. It's a, that's what I'm looking for. Um, there's, again, I've been sort of out of the game the last 10 months, so in terms of following that, but um, I haven't seen any huge stories about that right now, but we'll be, we'll be watching, but we had watched any administration on leak investigations, et cetera. Sure. Um, look, I, I think there's no question most journalists would tell you that, they, um, that threats have become part of you know, what we receive to varying degrees. I think social media has made it easier to issue threats to people, but it's an indication of kind of the tenor of the times. Um, and I don't think it helps when the president, um, uh, you know, calls the press the enemy of the people. But I also don't think uh, certainly you should pin incidents to date in the United States on him. And I think you need to be very uh, careful about that. Um, so I, I wouldn't jump to any um, conclusions, but recognize that it is a thing that is happening. And maybe it is just, you know, people being spun up and having the vehicle of social media. Um, you know, I think the, the hardest thing is get it, keeping a sense of perspective. I think George Orwell said, you know, the hardest thing is, uh, is, is uh, to keep a sense of what's under one nose is a constant struggle. And um, to see the whole chessboard as much as we are able, based on our reporting, to see the successes and the failures, to judge it against democratic norms, and to, I think, resist one of the, the conversations that, uh, that uh, can be had in newsrooms Criticism says, why are you always fixating on what Donald Trump says, what all these things he says aren't factually true? Why does that matter? Isn't that distracting from his successes and, and, and things like that? You need to be able to do both because the moment I think we in the press stop to say the thing the President of the United States just said is not true, whatever the intent, is, is when you start to, uh, it's a slippery slope to normalization at that point. And I think it is just about doing our jobs, trying to hold to uh, historic uh, standards of, of what it means to be a journalist. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, we, we think we are priests or perfect, um, but uh, we have a, a, a vital role to play. Um, and it's, I think, consistent with, with being a citizen. Um, we are all kind of stewards of our republic, and we should uh, care about these things and not make strategic decisions to overlook departures uh, from best past practices by presidents. Okay, I think that's a really good point to end on. I wanna thank everyone for being here and sticking around. Thank our panel and really appreciate it.